Welcome to our 1 p.m. final press conference of the meeting. We've entitled this one, the April 2010 7.2 magnitude Baja California quake, observations and implications for Southern California. We will have four speakers. Are you guys in the order you're gonna speak? And they will be speaking in this order. John Fletcher, Professor, Geology Department, Earth Sciences Division, Center for Scientific Research and Higher Education at Ensenada, Baja California, CICESE, Mexico. Eric Fielding, he's a geophysicist with the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Jerry Treeman, a geologist with the California Geological Survey in Los Angeles, California and Jay Parker, who's a software engineer with NASA's JPL in Pasadena. And uh, speakers, please, we have people participating online, and um, so if you could please use the cursor for, is it working? Oh, maybe it's not connected, or I guess this one. Hmm. Well, if you guys can figure it out, use the cursor, otherwise we'll just have to wing it. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, John Fletcher, and I'll be uh, giving the first presentation. And uh, basically, we called this press conference uh, to kind of share some of the really exciting results that, and things that we've been learning about a major earthquake that struck northern Baja California earlier this year. The participants have all been introduced, so I'm just going to go on to the um, main points that we want to cover today. Um, <clears throat> all of the participants of the press conference will be making three general points in, in each one of these presentations. The first is that um, the earthquake is a special event. Really, it's, it's got unparalleled complexity, and, and there's never been a, a surface rupture that is as complex that has been documented for the Pacific North American plate margin in, in, in the, at these latitudes. Okay, the second thing is that we've employed um, uh, new techniques in remote sensing and image analysis to give us new eyes to observe the event. And it's true that if you wanna uh, characterize any natural phenomenon, you have to be able to observe it. These techniques are giving us new eyes to, to look at it. And so uh, you may not know it, but there is a recipe for making important scientific discoveries. And that is you add one part a remarkable phenomenon with an equal parts of, of new ways to visualize that phenomenon, and you've got a really, we're laying the found foundation for making uh, big scientific discoveries, we think. Okay, um, so just in terms of general characteristics of the earthquake, it was a magnitude 7.2, which was the largest earthquake that's affected this part of the plate margin in 120 years. Okay, the epicenter was, oops, shooting Eric in the head. The epicenter was located about 30 miles south of Mexicali in the international border in northern Baja, California. And surface rupture extends from the, from the tip of the Gulf of California up to the international border. The uh, ep uh, aftershock epicenters you can see are distributed widely through the region and uh, triggered slip is occurring on all of these, uh, the network of faults in Southern California. All of the faults form part of the zone of shearing between the Pacific and North American plates. Okay, there was extensive damage done in the, in the Mexicali Valley, mostly to the agricultural systems and irrigation systems there, and it's estimated that um, between half a billion and a billion dollars in losses has occurred. Okay. Oops. So um, when we first started searching for the, the surface rupture related to the earthquake, uh, we all suspected that it was probably occurring on some of the major faults that accommodate plate margin shearing in this area. These faults have historically produced large uh, earthquakes in the past, and as well as surface rupture, which you can see by these pink lines. Um, the basic thing is, is we were wrong about that assumption. After flying over the area in helicopters and, and months of field work, uh, we now view the, the surface rupture as a uh, very compli complex um, distribution that um, is using at least six major faults 
um, many of which were not recognized prior to the event or unnamed, okay? Um, now, when I did the PowerPoint animation, it, the PowerPoint didn't go crazy. This is actually the way we think that the rupture traveled from the epicenter. First, it started on a fault that's oriented more north, north south, and then it propagated uh, laterally to the southeast and northwest. And in the extreme north, we think that it underwent a process called back rupturing and migrated from the north to the south back toward the epicenter. Okay? One of the um, next things that we learned about the earthquake and the surface rupture is that it did something very weird. It, it dropped the high mountains of the Sierra Cucapa down, and that almost never happens. In fact, I can't name another example where, it ha where surface rupture is actually lowering the high topography, the local high topography, okay? Um, what this is telling us is that either the, the fault system is very young and it's just, we're seeing the birth of a brand new fault system, or it's saying that the slip rates on these faults is very slow. Okay, this is a debate that we're currently having, you know, in, in the different scientific meetings. But um, the important thing for the press conference is to just understand that you can't even ask the question of whether the faults are slow or young if you don't know the distribution and the sense of slip to begin with. And so what I'd like to spend the remainder of the time of this, uh, of my presentation, is just showing you how we went about mapping the distribution of the surface rupture and, and the innovative uh, new technologies that were employed to do this. Okay, um, after about a week or two of field mapping and, and one day of which was with uh, aerial reconnaissance and a helicopter, uh, this was the distribution of surface ruptures that we had come up with. And the problem with it is we knew that there was unrealistically large gaps. This is like 30 kilometers or about, you know, 15, 20 miles where we had, we, we really didn't know where the surface rupture was between this, but we knew we had major breaks down there, major breaks in the north. The problem was in, in the helicopter, we were flying along all the known uh, fault lines that had historic earthquakes, and we didn't see rupture along that. Um, and we didn't have time to fly up each one of these linear valleys, that each of which are controlled by faults um, in, the, in the day that we had the helicopter. This is also a very remote part of Baja, California. Uh, just to give you an example, it would take you probably, you know, seven hours to hike from there to there, and there's no other way to get there by on, on the ground. So it's a, it's a logistically a hard problem, intractable, and um, so here's how we went about uh, solving how to map out the surface rupture in this area. First thing that, um, that was passed to the field geologist by Ken Hudnut uh, was an image uh, made by Sebastian Le Prince at Caltech. And what he's doing here is um, correlating pix pixel positions from spot satellite images taken before and after the earthquake. And he can show that by tracking the changes in pixel positions, that pixels shown in, in the yellow colors move to the east, pixels shown in the purple and blue colors move to the west. And the difference between these fields coincides with known breaks of surface ruptures. So um, Ken Hudnut uh, basically digitized the coordinates of, of the lines separating these two fields and passed it around to all the field geologists. It arrived to us by email in a format that we could open in Google Earth and the line happened to be colored yellow, and uh, thus began the search for the yellow line. Okay, um, the yellow line for the field geologists became kind of a mythical, uh, you know, had mythical proportions. And you can see um, us standing on the outcrop, kind of scratching our heads. This is after a half a day of hiking up arduous um, uh, canyons that were choked with house size angular class of, of recent rockfall created by the uh, shaking of the earthquake. Um, half a day of hiking, we finally get up to where the yellow line is, and there is surface rupture exposed. Okay, um, in the hot summer months when it started to be 120 degrees out, uh, we got smart and started using helicopters, but the point is, is that um, surface breaks detected first by geophysicists in Pasadena were used to guide the field geologists right to where they could make detailed measurements. You can see here a ridge is, is offset 
about six feet. Okay, we also, you know, so it put us right on the outcrops that we needed to, to make detailed measurements. And it also allowed us to document um, important phenomenon like the presence of fumaroles and steam vents that were generated by the mobilization of magmatic and water-rich fluids. Okay, um, we figured, the geologists figure that um, this will be, this fumarole will become a tourist attraction and we've named that uh, New Faithful. So with a half a day's walk, you can see New Faithful steaming away in the Baja California mountains. Okay, so this is a, um, a more complete picture of the surface rupture that was aided by um, the pixel correlation work that uh, Sebastian Le Prince did. But, um, and so what we can see is that, uh, that there's a whole host of new scientific questions that can be asked. For instance, when surface rupture comes to the intersection of two major faults, why does it follow one and not the other? Okay, and another question is, why does surface rupture propagate along a fault and then just simply die only to reform and propagate along entirely different strands? You can see that surface rupture is, is jumping about 10 kilometers in this case, or six miles, and then it does it again. The, the master fault that's controlling that continues happily to the north, but rupture somehow needs to, to get over onto a totally different strand. And so we're asking a whole host of new scientific questions. But one part of this is, has still been kind of intractable for um, mapping, and that's this area in the first step over. And so I'll show you how remote sensing has helped us um, define rupture in that area. Okay, part of the problem here is that the same process that creates rupture also destroyed it. Okay, and uh, you can see that in this high mountainous region, um, rock avalanches have taken out what used to be a relatively continuous rupture. And this portion of the rupture is basically, you know, one layer of boulders away from being completely buried and invisible to field geologists. But um, so you can see this is uh, just showing our helicopter tracks trying to survey um, in the rupture. And we were able to identify surface breaks in the areas of the yellow circles. Now this was uh, one of the first earthquakes in the world that, to have high resolution elevation surveys collected by LIDAR systems. LIDAR stands for um, light detection and ranging systems. And uh, it gives you an elevation uh, at a spacing of every 50 centimeters. And so we had, uh, we can document changes in the elevation that were related to the rupture in a very detailed way. And you can see that these changes define uh, discrete breaks in this, this complicated region where rupture is propagating from one fault to another. And now we've got a much more complete view of, of how the fractures are distributed through this area. Okay, not only that, uh, we've been able to use the image analysis to systematically collect displacement data, which is critical for uh, geophysical modeling of the release of seismic energy in 150 uh, different points along the length of the rupture. And the important thing here is that if the methodology is a big success and field measurements uh, closely resemble the um, image uh, results. Okay, uh, one last uh, use of, of geophysical techniques and the LIDAR uh, image processing itself is, is to resolve this question of the other jump over that I mentioned in the north. Um, just, okay. Um, we've got a, one of the, among the natural phenomenon that we see in this earthquake is presence of rupture along gently dipping fault planes. These numbers here are the inclination of the fault plane. You can see it's only dipping about 27 degrees. And we've got more of this up to the north where the inclination of the fault plane is very gentle. And what that, the reason why that's important is because these faults were once considered mechanically impossible to form in this tectonic environment. So um, one, we've got uh, low angle fault planes controlling rupture in the north and then a piece of it down in the south. And we've always proposed that these things are connected at depth and they're just buried beneath the, the alluvium that's filling the, the, the sedimentary basin. But we, you know, this was just a geolo geologist's hunch until um, we got new data that 
that shows, the LIDAR shows changes in, in um, surface elevation and, and in the yellow colors, uh, that's where the surface has gone relatively up. The cooler greens and um, blue colors is where the surface has gone down. And you can see that right along this fault break, even though we don't see surface rupture, we do see a warping of the surface over that area, and there's probably what we call a blind detachment at depth, movement on a fault that never really made it to the surface. So um, these are the kinds of, of issues that, that we were able to um, address. And so in conclusion, uh, we've had rapid exploitation of imagery, and it's really changing the way we map uh, surface ruptures. Okay, we've been able to narrow the zone of search and essentially find uh, needles in the haystack. We're also using new uh, remote sensing techniques to measure three-dimensional slip along faults and document uh, things that have never been seen before, like the warping and tilting of surfaces related to one earthquake. Thanks. The next speaker will be um, Eric Fielding. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, radar imagery. This is a, another technique. We're working together to understand this earthquake, and I've been working primarily on the radar uh, side of the, uh, of the imagery. The first images we started getting were uh, from the satellites, uh, the European and Japanese satellites. This image shows a map of the, of the whole length of the rupture, as John was just talking about. Uh, the, the rupture started at the epicenter in uh, the southern Mexicali Valley, propagated to the northwest through the mountains here. We can see the very large motion deformation uh, over a meter uh, to the west a meter eastward on the east side of the fault and a meter westward on the west side of the fault. But the satellite imagery also showed that there was an, an additional 60 kilometers or 40 miles of rupture to the southeast beneath the Colorado River Delta. And this was only visible with the satellite imagery and uh, was not detected uh, with the field work uh, until uh, we sent these images to the field geologists who, who were then able to go to the field and, and uh, confirm that these ruptures existed. The gray area here uh, is shows areas where the surface was highly disrupted uh, by the earthquake. And there's a, a variety of disruption processes that occurred, uh, including soil liquefaction, uh, flooding, uh, failures of levees and, the, and release of water from the, the irrigation systems. And as John uh, mentioned, this uh, was a major source of damage to the to the agricultural uh, communities in the, in the southern Mexicali Valley and, uh, and other uh, communities in that area. So the uh, satellite images were, uh, showed the area to the south. We also flew the NASA Uninhabited Aerial Vehicle Synthetic Aperture Radar, or UAV SAR, uh, airplane. It's, it flies on a Gulf Stream specially modified it, the radar is uh, installed in this uh, pod underneath the airplane. It's a uh, special uh, uh, modification to the Gulfstream airplane, uh, it allows the GPS uh, to control the location of the airplane to within a, a 10 meter or 30 foot tube. It can fly that same tube over and over, over uh, after months or years. Uh, and this allows us to take the differences between the radar images acquired at two different times and measure the, the ground motion uh, that occurred in between those two radar images. And this is the radar uh, difference image or interferogram that shows the ground deformation that occurred between uh, a flight that we had from before the earthquake on October 21st, 2009 and uh, the first flight after the earthquake on April 13th, 2010. And this shows uh, color contours of the ground surface motion. Each one of these color contours is uh, five centimeters of ground motion, or two inches. And the total motion here, uh, just west of Calexico, is uh, 80 centimeters of uh, motion to the south and downward. 
uh, due to the, the, the rupture in, uh, in Mexico, even though the, uh, and uh, so that's, that's the very large uh, motion that occurred due to the fault uh, slip further south. In addition, uh, as you, the, I've plotted here in the little circles the aftershocks. We can see there's a large number of aftershocks north of the border. And uh, when we zoom in on the area of, of the, on, on many areas of the UAV SAR interferogram or a fault uh, difference image, we can see these cuts or uh, creases or, or disc discontinuities in the radar phase. I've marked them here in black. These are small fault ruptures that occurred throughout the, uh, the Yuha Desert that's west of Calexico in, uh, in southernmost California. And I'll now show uh, an animation that shows we had uh, this image, which shows the deformation between October and April. This is the deformation between April and July. This is the deformation between July and September. So we have a whole series that we can actually track and find that these faults continued to slip in uh, June and July, especially a after a uh, large earthquake that occurred uh, on June 14th. Uh, this is a very new image that we just got uh, a few days ago. Uh, it was uh, between uh, using the radar image that was acquired on December 1st. Uh, they just processed this data and handed it to me uh, uh, just yet, uh, a few days ago. Uh, and this shows that, in fact, that now in this area, the fault motion has uh, stopped. So since uh, September, there's been uh, the motion in the Yuha Desert has, has, has essentially stopped. We also used the data from the European radar satellite to get uh, a, a more regional overview. And uh, this uh, image shows that uh, the contrast between this orange area that moved to the northwest and this blue area that moved to the southeast, that there's a, a fault uh, located here. And this is in the same location as this large circle, which was the location of a large uh, magnitude 5.7 aftershock of the main, uh, main April earthquake. And we believe that this is now a, a new uh, deep rupture that occurred uh, at depths between uh, uh, about four and seven kilometers depth, uh, both during this 5.7 uh, earthquake on June 14th and, and in the month or two afterwards. And the, by looking at the sequence of images uh, that I showed from UAV SAR and from the uh, satellites, we can see that this motion stopped by September. Just to uh, remind you of the main uh, results here, the radar difference imaging or SAR interferometry uh, measures the ground motion to uh, accuracy of a few millimeters or a small fraction of an inch. The large motions near the main earthquake reveal this complex fault pattern that John described. And the smaller motions uh, show triggered slip on a number of faults in the Yuha Desert that are transferring strain from the faults in Mexico to the Elsinore and San Jacinto faults that uh, uh, Jerry and Jay are going to talk about uh, briefly uh, uh, later. And in addition, uh, this, we've seen this, some of these faults continue to slip, uh, especially in June and July. And, but that late fault slip ended by September of 2010. Thank you. So the next talk will be by Jerry Trayman. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. Although the effects of the earthquake north of the border were really much smaller, of much uh, smaller scale than those to the south, um, we're looking at millimeters and centimeters of displacement rather than meters, it still had some important lessons to show us about how um, large earthquake rupture uh, changes and terminates at one end or the other. Here, we had a chance in the uh, Yuha Desert to look at these effects. Uh, the earthquake it did cause triggered slip on the San Andreas, San Jacinto, and Imperial faults, but those are uh, lessons we knew from the past and that was expected. As I say, in the Yuha Desert, uh, 
we went to take a closer look because there were a lot of uh, aftershocks, many aftershocks in this area, indicating to us the likelihood of surface rupture, which had not been documented in this region. Uh, closing in on the Yuha Desert area, in this map I show you, uh, prior to the earthquake, we had a very limited understanding of the faults in this um, local region crossing the border. We were aware of the Laguna Salada Fault as an active fault and the Elsinore Fault up in the upper left corner of the image. But the other faults in the area were really poorly known and we weren't even sure if they were active. So following the earthquake, one of our first goals in this area was to look at the known faults to see if there was indeed uh, ground surface rupture and also to do some reconnaissance to see if there was additional rupture in the region. One of the first places we visited was the Laguna Salada Fault, and we verified that there was uh, rupture from this earthquake triggered um, all along the fault. We also were a little surprised to find a western branch of the Laguna Salada Fault with much more continuous rupture than we anticipated. As you can see in the older image, the faults were somewhat discontinuous. But the biggest surprise was uh, in looking at the desert area to the east, we found other faults that had not been mapped before. So in summary of this early phase of our investigations, we verified rupture on known mapped faults trending northwesterly, and we discovered some new faults uh, trending northeast. And let me say these aren't brand new faults, they're merely newly discovered. They're probably of similar age to the other faults in the region. But th that wasn't the entire picture, and we learned with the uh, release of this radar interferometric data that there was much more to be seen. Uh, the imagery uh, really caught our attention for two reasons. One, the first thing we noticed was that the faults we had already mapped were clearly shown in this new imagery. And the second thing that really caught our attention was, wait, there are a lot more faults. If, uh, up in this region, you can see there are various linear discontinuities, linear breaks in the colors that indicate something has gone on in the surface. And this test indicates the likelihood of faulting. So let's take an, as an example the northern end of the Laguna Salada Fault and look at what the detail showed us here. In this untouched, unretouched image from the interferometric uh, data, we see abrupt color contrasts from yellow to red, from red to orange, yellow to orange, and all of these linear color contrasts represent areas on the ground where the ground moved differently on opposite sides of that line. That means to us a surface fault that moved in the earthquake. And when we look at what we had mapped before, uh, we see the remarkable uh, correspondence of the lines, these contrasts in the imagery to the faults we had already mapped. So immediately we knew that this imagery was a lot better than what we had seen in the past. Previous uh, radar imagery showed us that there had been displacement, but it didn't give us this accuracy of location. So we knew we had to look at some of these other lines. I'm sure you can see as well other contrasts that aren't uh, lined yet. And in additional reconnaissance, every fault line or suspected fault line we visited in the field had ground rupture from the recent earthquake. And this was uh, just a boon to us, a real windfall to the field geologists to be able to locate uh, this faulting in the desert uh, more readily. Applying the same methodology, we go back to the entire region and we highlighted every uh, color discontinuity that we could see in the imagery uh, mapped those as faults, and then went back out in the field. And er again, every one we looked at, we verified, uh, indicated surface fault rupture. Uh, up through um, mid-June or so, most of the activity, epicenters, and fault rupture were in this region. But then on June 14th, we had a major aftershock uh, in the western part of the Yuha Desert. Eric already told you about some of the uh, deformation on the Yuha Fault in the eastern part of this image around the yellow blob. But I'm going to focus a little bit more on the western part. And we see here in the upper left part of the image uh, some uh, sharper uh, yellow to red to blue contrasts, which told us that it looked like there had been, as a result of the aftershocks, ground rupture in the vicinity of the Elsinore Fault, which hadn't been seen yet in this event, and some other faults that complicate the area, such as the Akateo Fault Zone and our field work verified these ruptures. But another interesting thing in this image is a more subtle contrast. All of the color contrasts we've looked at so far, which indicated faulting to us, were very abrupt, sharp contrasts. But in between these two arrows, there's a, still a color change, but it's a little more diffuse, a little vaguer. And the other 
uh, radar imagery that Eric referred to also confirmed this and suggested that this was faulting at depth. This would be the fault that we believe is expressed by these uh, uh, ground displacements. And in fact, verifying, going in the field, there was no surface rupture along this trace, but there was evidence that a fault is there. It just didn't break through to the surface in this series of earthquakes and aftershocks. And this extension of the Laguna Salada fault provides us with a little more continuity and a suggestion of how this fault system from the south may tie in to the Elsinore Fault, which goes on up to the, through the Southern California area towards Los Angeles, or other faults such as the San Jacinto Fault. So again, to show you the remarkable contrast in what we've learned, this was the image of simple faults that we had prior to the earthquake and the uh, availability of this tremendous uh, radar imagery from the UAVSAR instrument. And this is the picture we have of faulting in this region now, uh, which is much more complete and demonstrates to us uh, the broad splaying of faults coming up northward from this rupture down in Mexico. And it also uh, shows us uh, this connection, possible connection between the Laguna Salada fault and the Elsinore fault zone. And then pulling back out again, uh, one of the other things we've learned from this uh, new data is the complexity of faulting and how it may um, help us understand the transfer of stresses from the faulting to the south up to the various faults in the San Andreas system of faults to the north, such as the Elsinore, San Jacinto fault zones. Jay? All right, we've, hmm, I have to hit one more button. I think, yes. We've been discussing how, uh, in addition to other methods, the NASA radar is revealing local surprises in the area near the rupture. Uh, and I want to focus a little bit on how the fault movements occurred that were triggered 60 kilometers to the north. And we'll also talk about how these precise images are adding realism to crustal models and forecasts. And I'll close with some thoughts about the UAV SAR project, which is blanketing the California danger zones with these kinds of high resolution change detection images. Okay, in this view of Southern California from just south of the Mexico border, we see some of the early sample images from UAV SAR flights. So you can see the flights are generally running east west in this region. We have uh, more data that is being processed to fill in between this and more flights scheduled. Um, each of these strips is a high resolution, very high definition image. There are 120 megapixels typically. And it's in the early data where we haven't been really watching very many years yet. Uh, there's a clear earthquake that you can see. We've already been looking at that data at the bottom strip. In that oval that's just to the north of that, there's another strip that I want to focus in on in a minute. Okay, um, I want to point out here that we have long fault strands extending from that rupture area right into Los Angeles and San Bernardino. There's one pink strip that's the Elsinore Fault that comes right into uh, the Whittier East Los Angeles area and the San Jacinto Fault, which includes the oval, goes right up into the San Bernardino area. And so what are these faults doing in response to this big event in Mexico? Um, you can clearly see the orange show the aftershocks and the triggered, um, triggered earthquakes, that these are, tend to line up along these two fault systems, the Elsinore and the San Jacinto. Um, another fact is that we are seeing some triggered slip at the south end of these faults that is indicating that some of the change in stress is uh, showing up there. In other words, that area is adjusting to the change in stress from the earthquake, and these faults are showing visible motions in response. So if I go all the way into my oval here, I get this picture, again, the same kind of radar image we've been looking at. And 
it's a little more subtle here, and I can't get my pointer to work, okay. But the, you can see a bit of a crease in the lower uh, right part of this plot from the, from the corner in the yellow up into almost the purple there. It's a curving crease. And there's some other subtle ones there. Um, these are changes in the landscape imaged by the radar between 2009 and April 13, 2010, chiefly due to this uh, Baja earthquake. And these creases resemble the kind of fault slip we were seeing before. So one of the first things that I think of doing is let's find the map of faults that I can find online. This is from the USGS Earthquake Hazards Program. Just overlay that and see if these are already very clearly obvious known faults. I'm not an expert in the faulting, so I have to look them up. But nonetheless, they fall right on top of these creases that we saw on the radar. These were already mentioned by Jerry that these have been verified in the field as slip events on the San Jacinto fault system. And makes us wonder, you know, what's going to happen. Well, this is a ripe fault system in the sense that although there have been earthquakes in this area of the San Jacinto in the last 50 years, there are large sections that have had no earthquakes in 100 years or more. So it's important to consider what could happen if there's an extensive earthquake that goes the entire length that hasn't already ruptured this last century. So. Another way to look at that is with simulations. I, I'm going to address here a, uh, a way you can run on a computer a 100,000-year virtual history of earthquakes and make movies of that using the major fault systems of California, as they're shown on the left there. And this kind of simulation addresses some hazard questions, such as, is the San Jacinto Fault liable to have full-length or mostly full-length earthquakes, or is it always rupture in little pieces? which would be moderate size earthquakes that might not damage as much. So this kind of simulation relies on real fault information over wide areas of the globe, or at least of California in this case, and that's exactly the kind of information that sweeping radar surveys can help provide. Um, this kind of simulation does, when you do 100,000 years, you produce scores of large Baja virtual earthquakes like the picture at the right. That big red blob is very similar to the kind of earthquake that we're talking about. Uh, and it's easy to find ones in the simulations that are followed by damaging earthquakes in, to the north three to 30 years later. There's also other times when it's not followed by anything for a while. I mean, it comes out differently every time it comes up. It's a statistical uh, demonstration in a sense. So this is part of the NASA Quake Sim program, uh, which includes earthquake simulations and resources for doing those. And so this is a research uh, simulation. It's not currently used for policy. We also have a forecast system in QuakeSim which tries to say which parts of California are more likely to have an earthquake than others in the next five years. And that's also a research forecast. It's available online. And uh, it's just, it's interesting that that takes into account the aftershocks that we've had up till now. So we put in the aftershocks we got from this earthquake and it changes the picture a little bit. So it is sensitive to that sort of thing. So here's the movie. Um, click the, no, not there, okay, run the apparatus. So you can see from, this is 100 years taken out of 100,000 years, and it'll run in about 30 seconds, 100 years and 30 seconds. So there's, the, the bigger splashes are big earthquakes, and if they happened where you lived, you would probably have serious damage. Um, but these are simulated in a long, long simulation. One of the things you notice is that the entire fault system of California is liable to large earthquakes, or most of it is liable to large earthquakes, all of it has earthquakes. And, um, and I just wanted to point out that, I can click on it again, here, that there's a big earthquake in Baja there, and then there's a big earthquake that already happened on the San Andreas not very long after in this little piece of the simulation. There's other times that it takes longer, okay? And it just reminds us that uh, simulations can help us understand hazard, and the simulations rely on data that we have to get from the field and that the radar can help us. So the vision for UAV SAR is to blanket all of the California major fault zones, especially in the urban areas, and to cover that every six months so that we can see what the changes are. These produce high resolution change of landscape type images. And we are covering the major faults. We are covering the, uh, the area between Los Angeles and, and Baja, as well as the rest of this area. 
and monitoring any changes that are going on on these faults because some of that does occur aseismically. It happens without earthquakes that really show it to you in a seismogram. Uh, within a few years, we should be able to, monitor, to be able to see slow changes in the landscape going on around the major faults, which give us clues about how fast those faults are slipping at depth, how quickly they're building up to a major earthquake event. But in the short-term data, we're seeing the earthquakes that happen now, and we're seeing some other fault slip events or creeping events like we've shown already. That's all right. So just to sum up, we've been seeing unprecedented complexity revealed in the rupture pattern in Baja and talked about the, how the new technologies are guiding geologists much more rapidly to the fault break areas so they can make their maps more quickly. We have satellite systems like uh, the um, European and Japanese INSAR systems that are covering the globe. Uh, UAV SAR, this airplane system is California danger zones. LIDAR is providing stunning detail where it's specially needed for close-in studies. And there is uh, coming up, by the way, a NASA mission called DESDINE that is going to uh, provide more frequent and more global coverage of these kinds of change maps. So these images are a key to improving hazard assessments. And we do, in fact, see images that are showing important signs of the stress from the Baja event uh, affecting two major faults to the north. And that does highlight the hazard to the Los Angeles area. And that's it for my part. And this is a time for questions. OK. Let's start with the questions. Uh, Horst Rademacher, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Uh, all of you have been very lucky, actually, that the earthquake occurred where it occurred, because it was a desert area. And between April and the aftershocks, there was no rain. So all the radar images uh, and the interferograms that you could deter from the radar images were OK. But what would have happened if that earthquake had occurred in an area with lots of plant growth, uh, lots of rain in between, like uh, Loma Prieta in the, in the hills that are, you know, grown over with, with old trees, or if you go even further north. Eric? Well, that's one of the advantages of this UAV SAR system that uh, we are using now. It has a longer radar wavelength of 24 centimeters. Uh, so it actually maintains uh, coherence of the radar uh, measurements, even when there's uh, significant vegetation or be able to image uh, deformation around the world. Rick Lovett, Freelance. Um, so I've got a, a couple of technical questions and then a more general one. The technical one is, so it's my understanding then, pardon me, that the, uh, uh, the 2009 mapping was part of an earthquake monitoring thing, so you had a baseline and you'd been watching these all along. Okay, that's, um, uh, another one is you talked about this, you did this simulation. And I'm really vague on how you run 100,000 years of earthquakes um, with 100 years of data that isn't really that good at data. Um, how, how do you, I mean, it looks like voodoo to me. <laughs> yeah, let me just say that uh, there are simplifications and approximations, certainly. Uh, but the author of, of that effort is uh, present in the room. Would you like to address that, John? Hold on. Can, you, can we have you talk in a microphone, please, and identify yourself? I'm John Rundle from UC Davis. Um, no, it's not voodoo. What it is is we um, construct a model of faults based on the best geological information that's available to us. And then part of that information is the average occurrence times on earthquakes on those faults. And that comes from a lot of geologic work that's done. And so then what we do is we take basically randomized initial conditions and run many, many examples of simulations starting from those randomized initial conditions. And the models typically have in them all the physics that you could imagine for faults, such as stress transfer between faults and um, the physics of friction and things like that. And then what you do is you generate large ensembles of potential events, and you saw one of them there. Um, so it's 100 years out of 100,000 years. But typically when we do these calculations, we do many millions of years of uh, simulations, and we stack them all up and look at the statistics of the events following the Baja earthquakes, for example. So we know enough about stress transfer to get meaningful results out of that. Yes, we do. It's uh, using elasticity. 
And, and my other question here is the general one, uh, which is, so what does this say for danger in California, um, in LA, uh, now compared to a year ago? Well, we know that the Baja California earthquake has uh, increased the stress on the Elsinore and San Jacinto faults. Uh, we don't know if that increase is enough to cause the, those faults to have a, an earthquake in the near future, or but it has definitely increased the stress on those faults. Uh, Horst Rademacher again. Another question, the flights were only north of the border. You didn't fly over the actual epicentral area with the um, uh, radar aircraft, is that correct? Uh, we're still working on getting permission uh, from the Mexican government to fly the airplane south of the border. That's an ongoing process of getting permission. Yeah, and realize this is a research program. We can't really promise how long it's going to go on or, uh, and, and, and it's, it's in many ways uh, still being improved as we, uh, as we learn more about it. So, Again, could you identify yourself and speak in the mic? I'm Ken Hudnett with the U.S. Geological Survey. Some of the results shown, for example, by Professor Fletcher included uh, imagery flown by NOAA. So a NOAA aircraft flew a DSS aerial photography camera and then the uh, National Center for Airborne Laser Mapping was used to fly post-earthquake LIDAR. So there were examples of airborne projects that were done uh, in collaboration with our SSA colleagues. Um, James Bila, freelance. Well, first, you may be interested to know there's a thing called Foster's Law, which says that the only people who find what they're looking for are the fault finders. I have a question about, you talked about rupture, and I wonder if you could distinguish between when you talk about fault rupture and uh, a rupture that would cause strong ground shaking and uh, what uh, geodesists refer to as afterslip. And an uh, analogy might be if you had a, a redwood tree and the, you looked at the crack in the bark and um, that's there because of the morphology of the structure of the tree, but it's not really telling you uh, about the heartwood. So um, can you distinguish, are we really looking at a, a, a large structure in the earth that deformed as a starting from this earthquake? Or are you saying all those little faults? It seems like if you only move a few centimeters, the magnitude of that earthquake is not going to be very big. So I'm, in terms of hazard, I'm trying to figure out whether we're talking about afterslip or earthquakes in relation to strong ground motion. And you haven't said anything about uh, GPS. You want to say something? Sure. <clears throat> I can try to field that. I mean, um, when we, when we talk about rupture, it's just uh, displacement across a fault. That can be at depth or it can reach the surface. So when it reaches the surface, that's surface rupture. And, and to the extent that all fault slip creates some form of ground shaking, then uh, rupture is a, is a process that does that, okay? Um, after slip is, is a phenomenon that, occur, that occurs on a network of faults that um, are, continue to make adjustments after the main event continue to slip and, and make adjustments. So um, that by itself is a creeping process and after slip doesn't necessarily produce, uh, uh, a, present a big uh, risk for, for uh, most communities. But um, so the, I think the important thing is that um, what, what after slip, the detection of these really small uh, surface motions tells us is that it's just the power of the technique. Not that these small surface motions present a huge risk to, to the communities, but that we're now able to, to see very small displacements of the surface, and uh, we're seeing them as a post-event phenomenon. But who knows, there might be um, the continual monitoring of the plate margin might 
uh, reveal some kind of a pre-event phenomenon as well. Small surface adjustments, you can't rule, you know, the possibilities are, are you know, definitely out there. So you're saying you might be able to get to prediction? I think that's a possibility, of course. You know, and, and I'm, I'm really um, excited by you know these really tiny displacements that we're able to go out to the field and um, confirm that you know we see them in these images, and then we're out. We go out to the field, and it guides us right to the fracture to to measure it. You know, and in the case of the main rupture, you know we're talking about huge displacements, and um, but. You know, it's it's really the very small ones that, that are have the potential. Uh, we saw displacements uh, on the order of millimeters, just a few millimeters that had been imaged in the UAFSAR imagery, and we documented these on the ground. I think there's a question as to the significance of this broad pattern of minor ruptures north of the border, and you have to realize this is in response to an earthquake well to the south. If we had an earthquake on the system closer to the border region, these same faults would probably respond in a much larger fashion. It's also telling us about how the faults in Mexico connect to the faults in California, which was a mystery before. It was just this big blank zone on the map. When You're, you get the last one. Okay. So does this display up at the north that you saw, is that, do you think that might be typical of the kind of the tail end of the run out of something like this, or is that something unique to this fault um, system? I think it will occur in other similar fault systems. In fact, in my last image, um, I think you have it in your handout, we see a very similar fault pattern at the northern end of the Superstition Hills Fault, uh, which is part of this broad San Andreas Plate boundary system. And in that area as well, at the northern end of the Superstition Hills Fault, we see these northeast trending displays that are helping transfer uh, stress to the adjacent faults in the system. And it's a similar pattern that we're now able to see at the northern end of the Laguna Salada Fault. I'd like to make a comment too, and, and based on the two possibilities, I would say both, because the horse tailing of fractures at the end of a main rupture is, is a very common phenomenon, um, and you can see it at all scales, even small fractures. Uh, but you know, in the in the case of this system, we see uh, big mountain blocks that are oriented northeast in the area where this rupture died. You know, and so. What that's telling us is that many ruptures have, have, have propagated through the area and they all kind of um, turn into that orientation at, near the border area. Okay, well thank you very much for coming and speaking about your work and thanks everyone for covering this. Um,